So after a morning like today, I have enough energy to go play in a football game. Like a pretty important football game. I don't know, say like 3.30 this afternoon. Oh, put me in coach, let's go. Go Bears. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Great start to this message. Go Bears. You know, I don't even really care. I really don't. I just like getting you all riled up. That's just fun for me. You know, I've actually enjoyed being a Bears fan more in Minnesota than I did in Chicago. <laughs> True story. Because I can get people going and there's like this little thing happening and oh, it's so much more fun than when everybody agrees with you. That's boring. <laughs> Well, hey, I do want to welcome you again this morning. My name is Brett, lead pastor here at New Life. And if you are new here this morning for the very first time, we are glad that you are here. It is an exciting day, baptism, opportunity to come and worship and be together. And so we're in week four of our series called In Pursuit. And we're talking about how God is awesome. And so we've been talking about the nature of God, the nature of man, the nature of sin. And today's topic is the nature of salvation. We started by saying the nature of God, God is awesome. And that that word should be held in honor for him and him alone. And that everything then less than God is not awesome, but God is awesome. He's awesome because he's creator, he's sovereign, he's self-sufficient, and yet he wants to be in relationship with us. And that is awesome. We then were created in the image of God to be reflections of God here on earth. And our value comes from showing people in this life who he is. But sin has separated that relationship, that there is a chasm between us and God. And that sin isn't necessarily the act itself, but the heart behind the act and that we need to be aware of that. We need to examine our hearts, know where our hearts are, which brings us then to today. The idea of salvation, the nature of salvation. And so I want to begin the conversation with this statement. And I want you to make a true or false claim on this. You can do it in your head. You don't have to do it out loud. But if I were to say this, the best things in life are free, what would you say? True or false? The best things in life are free. Found on a website with modern day proverbs, the best things in life are free is something that came from roughly 1927. It was in a play called Good News, a musical. It reached its peak. It was actually a song. The best things in life are free was the song out of that play, Good News. And it reached its peak of popularity in the 40s and 50s, was remade by a number of individuals, including Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, who made this version of the song. Take a listen. You get the picture. Man, how music has changed. <laughs> that song or that clip right there was only 38 seconds long. You know how many more words are in 38 seconds of music today? A lot more. But it reached popularity and became something within the 40s and 50s in the days of Bing Crosby where it was the saying, the best things in life are free. In fact, many adaptations have been made to that, which I found this one, which I thought was quite funny. The best things in life are free. Unfortunately, money isn't one of those things. <laughs> Too bad it's not. Contrast that, though, with another website that I found that had more modern-day proverbs on them. And this was one of those modern-day proverbs. Nothing in life is free. Nothing in life is free. In fact, poet and author Roger Hancock said this, nothing is ever free, 
though to you it be, somewhere, somehow, someone paid. The best things in life are free or nothing in life is free. Which one is it? Maybe it's a case of the six verses nine that we used in a series a while back, where if you look at it from one direction, it's a six. If you look at it from another direction, it's a nine. Maybe it's perspective. Is it one or the other? We're talking today about the nature of salvation. We're talking about the idea that God came himself, Jesus, in the form of man, and he died for us. As baptism symbolized today that the old life is gone, the new life has come. And last week we talked about this idea of within that then God keeps us blameless all the way to eternity. And so thinking about the fact that the best things in life are free or nothing in life is free, I want to use that lens this morning to ask the question, how does God keep us blameless? If Paul says to the Thessalonians and again to the Corinthians, that as you put your trust in this man named Jesus, that God is purifying you, that he's sanctifying you, that he's freeing you of sin, and that he will keep you blameless all the way to the end, I want to look today at how he does that and ask the question, is it free or is there a cost to it? So I want you to open up this morning to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be back in Genesis We've spent three out of four weeks so far in Genesis. The first three chapters are just chock full of stuff. We could be in these three chapters for a really, really, really long time. But today we're going to specifically look at just three verses. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, 8 and 9, and then verse 21. Genesis 3, 8 and 9, verse 21. But I'm going to read from 7 all the way down through 21. Actually, yeah, 7 to 21. I want to be able to understand the context of what these three verses are a part of. But I want us to really look at, here in Genesis chapter 3, this idea of being blameless and how God does it. So if you don't have a Bible this morning, I'd encourage you to grab one. We have free ones on the back. If you want one, we'd love for everybody in here at some point to have one. If you don't want a hard copy, you can uh, download one on any app. Uh, or in any app store, there's a number of good Bible apps. We use the Bible app in the app store. It's brown with yellow lettering. You can follow along with our notes. They'll be up on the screen behind me, but they'll also be in that app. If you want to save it, you can keep it with you and take it all week long. With the hope being that we read the Bible here on Sundays, but then we also take it with us every day throughout the week and that it becomes a part of who we are and it transforms us and changes our lives. So Genesis chapter 3, 7 through 21, looking at the idea of how God keeps us blameless and what the cost is if there is one. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Just kind of back up the first six verses in Genesis chapter 3. Eve has taken of the fruit in the garden, coerced by the serpent to do so. She then hands it to her husband. Her husband takes a bite, and they get to this point, chapter 7 or verse seven, where their eyes are opened. Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to eat, not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. What a story. You've probably heard it before. 
Maybe you've studied it in depth. You've been in a Bible study before that has investigated this, and you may know exactly where we're going. But it's a story that really shows God's love to each and every one of us. As we investigate this and look into who God is, we see his heart in the middle of this story. It's easy to read this story and think of this God who's harsh and has condemned Adam and Eve for their action, and now they're cursed for the rest of life. Or we can see a God of love, a God that is making sure that the ones that he loves will be blameless to the end of time. So how does he do that? First one is God seeks us out, verse 8. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God's in the garden. He'd been in relationship with Adam and Eve. He'd been walking with them, but this is different now. God's walking into the garden in a different situation than he was before. How so? Well, we've got to assume a couple things in this situation. As God's coming into the garden, it's different than before, and he knows this. We don't get this from this context. It doesn't tell us that God knows this, but we're going to assume a couple things within this because the Bible tells us that they're true. The first one is God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. Second is God is omnipresent because he's spirit. He's everywhere all the time. And third, God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. And yet I love what the author does here in Genesis. Author being Moses. Moses is attributed the first five books of the Bible. Moses is writing what God is doing. And Moses puts God in a time-stamped situation as a human being like you and me walking in the garden with no other context other than he's walking in to this situation. Is he surprised? No, he's not. God is not surprised about what he's about to encounter. And yet in the middle of what he knows, he still comes into the garden. He still comes to find his people. Which is a loving God that we then can transpose into our lives, saying the exact same thing about you and me. God seeks us out. How does he keep us blameless? First and foremost, he seeks us out. He comes into our situation knowing exactly what's going on. I love taking people to this passage when they tell me God would never come find me. He doesn't know where I've been. He doesn't know what I've done. He doesn't know what I'm thinking. Or even if he does, would he truly care about me? And the answer very clearly here from the very beginning of the Bible is yes, he does. Because God walks into the garden in a different situation knowing exactly what they had done, knowing exactly where they were, knowing exactly what they were thinking, and he still comes to find them. He comes to seek them out. Second thing then he does in his process of keeping us blameless is once he comes after us, he calls us out. When he seeks us, when he pursues us, he then calls us out. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? I love that phrase. Did God have to ask that question? Where are you? (laughs) No. And yet again, Moses puts him in this situation to make him human, to make him seem like he's asking that question for real, to give us a glimpse into what a loving father would do. Have you ever been in a situation if you have kids? where you walk into a place and you know something just went wrong. And your kids are still in the room. You know exactly what happened. You know what they did. And you look over and you see a little foot sticking out from behind the piano. And you know where they are. And yet you still ask the question, where are you? Where are you? Because what God's doing in this situation is he's calling them out literally and figuratively. He's calling them out, asking the question, where are you? Because they were hiding. They were trying to stay away from God. They did, not wanted to be, they did not want to be seen by God. And so they've gone somewhere and they've hid. And figuratively, he's calling them out because he wants to see, will they tell me what they did? I've been there. As a father, as a loving father, it'd be very easy for me to storm in the room and go, what did you do? In fact, in my family, there's moments where I've done that. In fact, my kids call it beast mode, right? From Beauty and the Beast. What have you done? Why didn't God do that? 
Why don't he blow open the doors and just start screaming, do you know what you have done? Because that's not who God is. Instead, God comes in and goes, where are you? To see how they would respond. Would they come out? Would they show themselves? Would they admit to what it was that they'd done? And he does that for me, and he does that for you. He comes into your life knowing the situation, and he asks you the question, where are you? Where are you? Wanting to know how we're going to respond. Are we going to come out? Are we going to acknowledge what just happened? But see, in our lives, we'd rather not. We'd rather cover ourselves and try to fix it on our own, which is exactly what Adam and Eve tried to do at first. They tried to cover themselves up without going to God. In verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The first step in trying to fix the problem is to cover for yourself, right? How many people have walked into a room with your kids, and they start making up a story? They start covering for themselves while they're holding the item in their hand that they just decimated your room with? I wonder where the fruit was that they took a bite of. Was it lying on the ground right next to them? Was it visible? Was God able to come in and see what they had done and seen the issue at hand? And so they cover themselves in two ways, the same way that we do. First is through silence. When you've done something wrong, what's your first response? More often than not, it's for each of us to go, I'm not saying a word, which is hilarious. Because if you ever watch Cops, you ever seen that show? Where like the bad guy's busted, it's obvious he's done the wrong thing, and then they like arrest him and they ask him, what'd you do? Nothing. Doesn't say a word. You ever been there with your kids where you walk into the room and it's all over their face that they've done something wrong and they first try to just not say anything? Or when they're still hiding like Adam and Eve thinking, if I just don't say anything, he won't find me. If I'm just quiet, maybe they'll just turn around, walk out of the room, and they won't do anything about it. Well, guess what, guys? That only happens in video games. That doesn't happen in real life. When you've done something, you've got to own up to it. You've got to acknowledge it, and yet we still try to hide it. And so we start by being silent. Well, when silence doesn't work, what do we do then? We create a story. We create a story. Their story started when they covered themselves with fig leaves. As God calls them out, they had tried to hide themselves. And so they created the story. And then when they finally came out and they started acknowledging what they'd done, Adam goes, she did it. Blame her. She's the one that gave it to me. I ate because of the one that you gave me. Did you see that? He's like, turn it back on God. You gave her to me. You gave it, it's your fault, she did it, she gave it to me, you actually gave her to me, I ate it. Adam then, or God then looks away from Adam, looks to Eve, and she's like, so, so what's your story? And she's like, the serpent did it, the serpent did it, you ever blamed anything on a snake? That's really stupid. <laughs> but the snake was crafty. They told a story. And it started unraveling. And yet God was still there. But see, as God continues to make us blameless, he seeks us out, he calls us out, and he allows consequences to our actions. As God is in the garden with Adam and Eve, he's relational, he's there with them, he has come after them, he knows what's going on, but he then allows consequences to happen. And there's two types of consequences in this story. First one is natural. There were natural consequences to Adam and Eve's decision, to their heart issue, to their desire to not listen to God, to take of the fruit, to eat of it. The natural consequence was all of a sudden their eyes were opened. They did become like God. They learned the difference between right and wrong. And what ends up happening is they got something that they never expected, which just happened naturally. They realized they were naked. They were afraid and they hid. 
See, oftentimes God allows the natural consequences to be the first thing. And then he sits there and he goes, hmm, natural consequences, maybe it needs to be more. And as a parent, we do the same thing. I oftentimes go to the natural consequences first. You made this decision. Here's naturally what happened. Is that enough? Well, I would say yes. In this moment, part of me wants to go naturally. That should have been the only consequence. Because as I say the word naked, just standing on the stage, most of you go, oh, the pastor just said naked. <laughs> yeah. That's still a word that makes every single one of us kind of go, oh, naked, naked. What if I said it a hundred times? Naked, naked, naked. <laughs> that was only four. And you're still kind of like, oh, yes, because there's still shame in nakedness. A natural consequence of the fall is that we wear clothes. That there's shame in our nakedness. And they were afraid because they knew they'd done something wrong. Was that enough? Well, it wasn't because of another part of this. And that's that God had to come in and impose his own consequences on it so they would truly learn the lesson. And that, again, is a sign of a loving father. Coming in and looking at the situation and going, okay, so where do I go from here? And what God determined is that there had to be imposed consequences. And so because of that, they had to deal with things they never had to do before. The serpent apparently could walk. Now he couldn't. He had to crawl on his belly for the rest of his life. The woman, think about this lady's child labor was easy. There was no pain. And all of a sudden there was. And working the land was going to be hard. And there were going to be weeds and there were things that they're going to have to deal with that they weren't going to have to deal with before. Because a loving father allowed them to deal with the consequences so they would learn the lesson. And that's where many of us get tripped up. We don't like that idea of consequences. It would have been so much easier if God had just fixed it. Why couldn't he have fixed it there? Because he understood the long game, the end game, was that people would follow after him willingly, that they would make a decision to come after him. And if he had just fixed it there, they wouldn't have learned the lesson that they needed to learn. But he also knew that that lesson was something that was going to go on for many, many years, that you and I would have to learn that lesson. And so he kept those consequences where they were at. And to this very day, we still struggle with that because we don't want to deal with the consequences. We'd much rather have God come in and take care of everything to where I don't have to. I want him to carry one of these. See, my desire is I just want God to be a cosmic janitor, right? Can't he just clean up everything for me? Can't he just take his giant push broom or dust mop or whatever it is? And can't he just come in and go, whoop? Oh, sorry, front row. My bad. My bad. <laughs> so, I am so sorry. <laughs> You know, that enhances illustration. We want God just to blow it all away. <laughs> just get rid of it. Just clean it up. Just take it all away. And yet that's not what God does. That's not how it works. That's not reality. And then we get mad because he's not taking it all away. And we throw a fit because he doesn't sweep it all up. He doesn't get rid of the mess. You know what he does instead? He doesn't get rid of of the mess. He doesn't sweep it all away. Instead, God covers it. See, God doesn't take it from us. He doesn't eliminate it. He doesn't sweep it away. Instead, he covers it with his blood. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. See, God doesn't clean it up, he covers it up, which is way better. Because we try to cover it up and we'll never be successful when we do. Proverbs 13a says, whoever covers his transgressions will not prosper. Adam and Eve tried to cover their transgression. They tried to cover the situation. And the Lord has made it very clear that when we do that on our own, we will never prosper. But in Psalm 32, 1, it says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. In 21, there in Genesis 21, 321, 
gives us an understanding of what was going to come. 321 is believed to be the very first sacrifice in the Bible. That God came in and did what Adam and Eve could not do. They inadequately covered themselves with fig leaves. And God said, no, you need a covering that's actually going to cover you. And he covered them with the skin of an animal. A sacrifice was made which was a precursor of what would come, not just the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, but this idea of Jesus, that he would come, that he would come to us where we're at, in the situation that we're in, in the mess that we're in, that he would not take it away, that there would still be consequences to our actions, but he would cover us in it, that we would still be in the mess, but we would no longer be of the mess that we would be in the mess. See, they still had to deal with it. They still had to live there. They still had to carry on with their everyday life, which is exactly the same with you and me. But God made the promise, I will cover you now so you will be adequate. You will no longer feel shame. You will no longer be be naked. I will give you the covering that you need. You will still be in the mess, but you will no longer be of the mess. Which was something that was ordained from the beginning of time. Revelations 13, 8 C says this, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. From the very beginning, God knew that this was going to happen. And he had a plan. And he shows us that plan in the first three chapters of the Bible. And he says, you too can be a part of my plan. But what if God had just not dealt with it at all? What if he'd made it differently? Why did he have to create us in the way that he did for us to make a decision that was made to have this plan from the beginning? Why couldn't it have been different? And the argument I always go back to is because then it wouldn't have been a relationship. Because God wants us to be in relationship with him. He didn't want to create robots but he created us out of love, out of his desire to know us, to be with us, knowing what was gonna happen, he still said, it's worth it. You're worth it. That I will give them the opportunity to be in relationship with me, to choose whether or not they want to know me, that I will cover them in their issues, that I will come after them. And at the end of the day, they have an opportunity to be in relationship with me. As a loving father, I get it. Picture your kids, if you're a parent. If you were told at the very beginning, before you knew them, before you ever held them, before they were even a thought, if you were given everything you know about them now, the joy, the connection, the love that you have for them, and you were told there's a chance that they might walk away, would you still do it? The answer is yes. I would. I would do it every time. And that's what God did with us. I'm gonna create them out of love. And there's a chance that they're gonna walk away. And yet they're still worth it. And the beautiful thing about a loving father is that even in the consequences, he gave us a way out. And that way out was himself. That the lamb was slain from the beginning of creation because he loved us so much, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us that in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he's come for us where we're at and he's died for us. In that, we're now new creations. The old life is gone. The new life has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. New life is here. And all of this is from God. Why? Because he was reconciling us back to him through Christ. Because he loved us so much. And that's how he keeps us blameless. It's nothing that we've done. It's nothing that we ever will do. It's what Jesus did that in him, we're still in the mess, but we're not of the mess. And God has said, there is a way out. I have paved the way for you because I love you. And guess what? It's free. It's free. 
Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The nature of salvation is it's free. It's free to you and me. It's a gift that's been given. It's a God that comes after us in our situation, knowing our thoughts, knowing our actions, knowing where we've been. And he says, I love you so much that I will give this to you. It's free to you and me. But there was a cost. The cost was Jesus' very life. That he came, that he died, that he covered us. That he put us under his blood, and that when you say, Jesus, I am in, when you show the world that you want to follow him, when you give your life to him, when you commit to him, he will keep you blameless to the end of eternity. Not because of what you have done, but because of what he has done. And so I'm going to ask you today, have you made that decision? Have you said, Jesus, I'm in the mess. I don't want to be in the mess. I'm naked and afraid. I'm not sure what I should do. I've tried to cover myself, and it's been inadequate. It's not working. But Jesus, I know you can cover me. Because he's inviting every single one of us into that relationship to know him personally, to be again with him, blameless as they were in the garden that we will be covered from now until when Christ returns and for the end of eternity. And that's a gift that God has given us, but it's only available in this life. Because what you see as you continue on, which I didn't read, but if you go further into the chapter, more of the consequences are that God kicked them out of the garden. He put an angel at the front of the garden. They weren't allowed back in because he understood something, that there was still a tree in the garden they could eat of, the tree of life. And they ate of the tree of life. They would be eternal beings in the state that they were in. And God said, we will save them one more time and we will allow them to die. That's a crazy thought. That God gave us the opportunity to die so that we would not have to be in this mess forever. Because death isn't the end, it's a doorway to eternity. It's not the place that we fear because when it's done, it's over. Actually, we should fear this place. We should dread the fact that we're here every day. We wake up going, really, I'm still here? Oh, this is awful. And God knew it was going to be bad and didn't want them to eat of the tree of life in the garden because they would have to experience this forever. That sounds awful. Instead, he gave us a way out. He kicked us out of the garden because he's a loving father. He gave us eternity. He gave us a free gift that all we have to do is accept it, that he paid for it already, and then eternity will be ours once this life is over. Praise the Lord. So I long for the day that Christ returns. I long for the day that this life is over where I will see my Savior once more. As Paul said, if I live this life, I will live for Christ. But if I die, I gain. (laughs) Because God has given us eternity. And it's free. To you, to me, to anybody that hears his words. And then while we're here, we get a chance to be in relationship with him. That we get to experience God in small glimpses in this life so we can long for the day where we're with him forever. So how do we experience him? Build routines into our lives. Praying, fasting, and pursuing him every day to the day that we are reunited. So what does it look like to do that? What are the steps? What are specifics when it comes to praying and fasting? Come back next week and find out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are a God that loves us, that comes after us, that seeks us out, that calls us out where we're at. That doesn't take away the consequences so we can understand what it is that you're teaching us, Lord, but covers it while we're in the middle of it. Through your blood, you have made it right. And you have promised that in your blood, you will keep us blameless to the end of time. Lord, we thank you that we have this promise. That in this life, we have the promise of you. 
And that we don't have to live this life forever stuck in this place, but rather you gave us a way out. Jesus, you died for us, not because of what we have done, but because of what you did. And you promise eternity for all of us. Lord, we thank you so much for that promise. We praise you for who you are. And that you have promised you will keep us to the end of time. Jesus, we give it all to you in your name. Amen.